welcome back. In this video we're going to build on our knowledge of groups that we've started off with um, and we're going to try and discuss some basic properties of groups that apply to every single group. Now we've already come across one of these. Uh, we looked at the identity of a group and we proved that there could only possibly be one identity in any given group. Um, remember the axiom just said there exists an identity, that's a requirement of a group, but actually we can prove that there is only one and so it makes sense to talk about the identity of a group. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few results of those na of that nature in this video and we'll yeah build on some things that will be useful for us. But before we do that, let's just recap a few the, a few things that we need to keep in our minds while we're talking about this. So remember the the group axioms are essentially as follows. We have the following things need to be true to be a group. So I'll call number one, the operation needs to be a binary operation. That means that the operation is closed. If I put two things together through the operation, I get something back from the set. Um, one, I need to have an identity, of which we have shown there's only one. Three, every element must have an inverse. And four, that the group operation is associative. Okay, that's the one that is ABC equals ABC. So whenever we're talking about groups, those are the four things that need to be true. But we're going to try and essentially add to this list by using those four properties um, to build some extra theory on top of that. Right, so here's the first one that we're going to look at, and it is cancellation. So it's two different statements, and I've just written, written them down in sort of compact form rather than giving us all the words we need. But essentially, if you've got a group with elements in it, you want to take an expression like this and cancel off the B, the A's on the right, for example. Or similarly, we will want to be able to cancel things off on the left. Again, it's the kind of thing we just sort of take for granted, but in groups, it's always true that we can take a statement like that and cancel off, for example, the A's here. Okay, so we want to actually prove this and so that from then on, we can always just cancel without second thoughts. Remember, in normal algebra, we have to be careful when we cancel things off because we had to we had to worry about things being equal to zero. So we'll, st we'll do the second one. Um, the proof for the two are about the same. So we'll prove the second statement, AB equals AC. Now remember that all we've really got to work with here are those four rules about how the group works. So we want to prove that AB equals AC implies, okay, that right arrow just means implies, if the left-hand statement is true, then it follows that B is equal to C automatically. Okay, no division, but no zero issues to worry about. Okay, so we want to do this. We want to make use of what we've already got, which is not very much. So what do we have? Well, we've got identity, and that's unique. So we might want to make use of that, possibly. We've got inverses, and we've got associativity, but again, that's probably not going to be something we'll use here. So think about it for a second. What do we think is going to be the most useful thing that will help get rid of the A's from our expression here? Well, we know that A has an inverse, right? So A has an inverse. Okay, it may have more than one inverse at this point in time, and we don't know this. The axiom just says every element must have an inverse. It doesn't say anything about how many. And we know, so we know that we can pull out an element A prime, and this will definitely be true, as will this. A prime A equals the identity. We know the identity is unique, so we know that's in our group, um, and we'll call it E. So if we can just multiply our expression through by A prime, that will cancel off the A, and hopefully it will give us what we want. So let's just do it step by step using each property as we go. So I'll say let A prime be an inverse, being a little bit careful about the language because um, we don't, there may be more than one possible inverse of A. Okay, it's also sort of given here that G is a group and that A, B, C are members of G. Okay, in the full statement of the problem we'd put that information in there. Okay, so let A prime be an inverse of A, then if A, B, equals AC, it follows that A prime AB equals A prime AC. 
Okay, so it's a standard statement. If this, if this statement AB equals AC is true, it follows that if I multiply both terms on the left by A prime, that will also be the case. I could write that more compactly as AB equals AC implies A prime AB equals A prime AC. But just sort of a note on style, when I'm writing a proof, I try to avoid using symbols too much because words are often easier just for your brain to grasp. So I would suggest where possible use words to describe things rather than relying overly much on putting lots of symbols in. Not that there's anything wrong with symbols and sometimes they're extremely useful, but just for readability, often putting English words in is a good idea. Okay, so we're being really painstakingly rigorous and careful here. So the next step would be to say, okay, I want to make use of my identity statement, a, a prime, oh, not that one, the other one, a prime a equals e. But at the moment, my parentheses are in the, are in the wrong place. Um, and we could say, therefore, we can move the parentheses because the group operation is associative. That means the order in which we evaluate terms like this one, it doesn't matter. We can evaluate A prime A first or we can evaluate AB first and we'll get the same result. Okay, so just a little note as to why we did that by associativity. And hence, EB equals EC, or B equals C. Because we know that once we've got an identity, identity times an element just equals B, and an identity times the other element just equals, uh, sorry, C, just equals C. Okay, so we just used the basic properties of the identity here. To get to this statement here, we use the associativity of the group operation to get from this one to this one. And we use the existence of an inverse to get from this statement to this one here. Now, not every proof is going to need quite so much painstaking step by step um, steps involved in it. Uh, we will often just sort of take it as given a lot of things like this. But when we're just starting out, just practicing get into grips with what we're actually doing here. It's good to sort of spell these things out in a lot of detail to be happy that we're actually doing steps that are valid because the trap we can sometimes fall into is using manipulations that we're used to from the algebra we did at school or earlier on in our degree. And some things are not necessarily allowed. So we're just going to make sure we keep within our rules that we're defining and build up our theory that way. Okay, so um, moving on from that previous one, the next theorem that we want to look at is the uniqueness of inverses. Just like with the identity, we don't want there to be multiple inverses for any given element. And again, the notion of inverses has mostly come up during linear algebra in the past few probably. And we could talk about the inverse of a matrix rather than an inverse of it. So the theorem is for every group element, the inverse of the element is in fact unique. Each element has only one inverse and every element has an inverse because that's one of the properties of groups. Okay, so we want to make use of what we've got to prove this. Now we may be able to use some of the results we've come up with. Like for example, we might be able to use the uniqueness of identity to use E and that kind of thing. Okay, so to prove that something is unique, same trick as we've used previously, uniqueness, Generally speaking, the strategy that we're going to uh, approach is to assume two things and show they're equal. That's usually a good way of going about it. Um, we'll assume that there are two inverses and we won't make any other assumptions upon that. And then we'll show through some steps that those two inverses have to be the same thing. So the first thing I need to do is I'm going to say, suppose that B and C are inverses of A. We want to show, I often like in my proofs to write what we want to show as part of it. We want to show B equals C. If we can establish that, then the inverse of A is unique. Okay, so you might want to take a moment just to satisfy yourself with that fact as being what it is that we actually want to prove, um, and then we'll move on. Okay, now we just essentially want to make use of the information we've got to see if we can say something useful. Well, we know that B and C are both inverses of A. That means 
a times b is equal to e, the identity, but there's only one, we know that now. And also, a times c is equal to the identity. Now maybe you can see how this is going to work here. If I take a, b and a, c, and they're both equal to the identity, this will mean that a, b, in fact, is equal to a, c. And we can then cancel off the a, and that will be what all we need. So this one's actually quite straightforward. All we need to do is just make sure we write that down correctly. So we've got our b and our c. We then want to say, then, because they're both inverses, a, b equals e and AC equals E. And I'm also making use of the uniqueness of the identity. I don't have an E and E prime. We know there's only one, so that's what it's got to be. Hence, because this is true and both things equal E, AB equals AC, and thus B equals C by left cancellation. Okay, our previous theorem said that we can cancel things on the left, so I've cancelled the a's off, and therefore b equals c. Hence, there is only one inverse of a. And from now on, we can start talking about a inverse rather than talking about an inverse. Right, this next one is pretty simple, but it's, it's a kind of thing we'll be using all the time. And again, you'll recognize the formula from linear algebra, and it's the so-called socks and shoes property. Now, if we were imagining back to our experiment with D4, uh, transforma the transformation to the square, um, we can interpret a group product in that, in that sense as being apply B first, then apply A. Okay, so remember you, you start from the right. You do the one closest to the square on the right there first, and then you, so you do B first, and then you do the transformation A. And the socks and shoes um, property says to undo this transformation, you do the inverse of A first, and then you do the inverse of B. So the order is reversed. Why, what, why is it called socks and shoes? Well, if B is the act of putting on your socks, and then A is the act of putting on your shoes, to undo that process, you need to take your shoes off first, and then take off your socks. So it has to happen in the reverse order. Okay, so this one we can kind of prove directly by just writing down the product and seeing how it works. So if we take B inverse A inverse times AB, okay, so we want to show that B inverse A inverse is the inverse of AB. So we're going to take this expression, and if we can make it turn into the identity, then we're done. Okay, so I want to show... B inverse A inverse AB is equal to the identity. All right, now we're just going to make use of associativity to regroup this calculation. Now, remember, associativity just changes where the parentheses go. It doesn't change the actual order. You can't rearrange the terms because it may not be commutative, but we can freely reposition parentheses like this. Okay, B inverse times A inverse A times B. Okay, that's just by the associativity of the group operation. Now that equals B inverse times the identity times B. And again, by associativity, we can do one of those calculations before the other. So that just equals B inverse B, which equals the identity as required. Okay, that's good. So therefore the inverse of AB is B inverse A inverse. So notice again, before we move on, the structure of how I laid that one out. I started with the thing, and then I'm now using equal signs because I'm just simplifying at each step, and I'm saying this thing equals B inverse times A inverse A times B, which in turn equals this, which in turn equals B inverse B, which in turn equals E. So the whole thing is one big long chain of equal statements this time, with the left-hand expression getting simpler and simpler until I get to the thing I'm actually after. That's another common way of laying out a calculation. So this whole thing is one big long statement that, that makes sense if you take the left and the right hand term as we want. Right, now the last thing I want to talk about is just the notation we're using for groups. So as we've seen, sometimes the group operation can look a bit like multiplication, in which case we use the multiplicative notation that I've pretty much been using most of the time so far anyway. 
But sometimes, especially for abelian groups, the operation looks a bit more like plus. So you'd only ever use additive notation if you're working with an abelian group. If you're working with a multiplicative, a non-abelian group, you'd always use multiplic multiplicative, but sometimes you use multiplication for abelian groups too. But pretty much you'd never use additive notation unless your group was abelian. Okay, so what we're just going to do is a little exercise just to get used to writing down the same state, the same terms in multiplicative and additive notation because we need to be good at going from one to the other because sometimes the theory looks a little bit different depending on the notation when actually it's just the same thing. So in multiplicative notation, composing two elements together using the group operation just looks like multiplying them. In additive notation, it just looks like A plus B. The, the identity in a multiplicative group uh, is usually written as E or 1, and we usually call it 0 for a group using additive notation. Now before I give you each one of these, you should be trying to think about what it might be yourself before we actually write it down. Okay, so the inverse of an element, we kind of did this already when we did the integers under addition as a group. The inverse of an element is A inverse if we're using multiplicative notation, and it's just negative A if we're using additive. Likewise, A to the power of N in multiplicative notation means A times A times A, N times, and in additive notation, that looks like n lots of a. But we don't think of this as multiplication. We think of this as a shorthand for a plus a plus a plus a n times. Okay, that can occasionally get a bit confusing when we're dealing with groups of numbers under additive notation. And we multiply by, when we take n of them, it looks like we're multiplying and it can get a little bit weird. But actually that just means take a and add it together n times. Okay, so let's just take a combination of those things. A times B inverse, that looks like A minus B. Okay, one other little note. A to the minus N is a notation we often use. That equals, the way to think of negative powers is, I should say, for N greater than zero here. Negative powers, think of this as A inverse times A inverse times A inverse N times. Okay, which you can also write as A inverse to the power N, which also is A to the power of N inverse. They all mean the same thing. So negative powers of negative integer powers can be made sense of in this way. Okay, so that's about all I want to do for now. So we've now I've got a few extra little pieces of information that are useful for us that apply to every group, no matter what it is. Um, we know that we can always talk about the inverse of an element. Every element has an inverse, and it only has one. We know the identity is always unique, and it's, so there's only going to be that. Uh, that's always going to be the case, so we can refer to the identity. And we know that we can cancel things off without having to worry about anything annoying like dividing by zero. Okay, so we'll leave it there. and we'll